Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're safe and well. Uh, thanks to SPTC for organizing this amazing event. Shame we can't meet in person, but I guess this is the next best thing. Uh, I'm very ho happy to host this panel for you today. My name's Steve Schreier. I've been in the business around 20 years. I started in Malta in the early days, and I helped build a prominent game supplier, uh, which we sold to Playtech in uh, 2011. Since then, I've had various senior commercial roles in the business, and most recently, I was the Chief Commercial Officer for Scientific Games Digital Division. And now I run my own company in the, called Sales Tribe because of a book I'm publishing, um, but I also have a very successful consulting business in the industry where I help, I'm mainly nowadays helping operators and suppliers get into newly regulated markets like the USA. So today's topic is the art of slots management. So usually between 80 and 90% of the revenue in a casino product comes from the slots. And this, so this makes it the most important part of the casino offering to get right. But there are a massive amount of offerings on the market today. So today we're going to look at how operators manage these dynamics for the benefit of their players and for their businesses. There'll be a Q&A session at the very end, so please uh, drop some questions into the, uh, the, Q the questions section by hitting the Q&A button on your screens. And luckily, we have four amazing slot management artists to talk to us about this topic today. So uh, we're going to start by each of these guys introducing themselves one by one. And when they're doing that, they, please introduce yourselves with your casino products, the regions and markets you work in. And please tell attendees how the slot games get on your offering, who chooses them, how they're managed, how do you build them, who drives those decisions, et cetera. Uh, so let's start with uh, Sam. Sam Brown, please. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, very happy Friday to you. Um, my name is Sam. Um, I work for uh, Hero Gaming. Um, I manage uh, the commercial aspects of the business here at Hero Gaming. We are a uh, B2B and B2C business in most uh, in the most sort of regular casino sense. Um, we have a bunch of our own European facing B2C brands. Um, you've probably heard of Speedy Casino, uh, Hero um, Casino Heroes, Boom Casino, Simple Casino, um, and we also um, operate businesses on behalf of um, some other clients in the Asian markets. Um, most sort of notably probably our Japanese brand, uh, Cassie Tabby. Um, so um, on the sort of subject of slots management, let's say, um, well, I took a look today and we are currently managing around 3,000 uh, slots titles um, from 111 different game studios. Um, you know, some of those are aggregated through platforms, some of those through direct integrations. Uh, but as Steve mentions, uh, uh, a, a phenomenal amount of content to be, to be managing. And, and we typically add uh, somewhere in the region of uh, 100 or so new slot titles each month. Um, all of that is managed by a centralized uh, games team. And that games team is made up of a bunch of experts who based on various uh, discussion points today um, are making those decisions on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly basis to, to optimize those casino revenues. I think we can uh, end the intro there, as I guess a lot of the other stuff will come up later. I'm sure. Thanks, Anne. That's, that's great. Stefania, do you want to say hi? Sure. Thank you, Steve. Uh, hi, everyone. Nice to see you and nice to meet you. Uh, well, so my name is Stefania Rinku. I work for Elman Group. I'm a head of casino there since February. And I've been in the gaming industry for the past seven plus years. Uh, I work for operators, mostly for operators actually, uh, within uh, the gaming industry like uh, Unibet or Quiff. Uh, and now I'm very happy to be with, uh, with Elman. Uh, we have two big brands at the moment, Casino Room and Highroller.com. And we operate uh, under Swedish license, MGA, as well as Curaçao. Uh, when it comes to uh, game offering, well, it depends. When, it, uh, when we're speaking about roadmaps, we actually have a dedicated casino team, including myself. And we pick uh, carefully what we take from, uh, from all the releases, because we don't have as much space. But as Sam said, we'll go into that later. 
Uh, and when it comes to new providers, I think it's a decision that we take uh, together as a team. Uh, if it's a new integration, obviously there are more departments involved. So then, uh, yes, everyone uh, should have their say. Thanks, Stefania. Marco, please introduce yourself. I think you're on mute. I'm Marco Castaldo, and I was on mute. Uh, so uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so I'm the CEO of Microgame. We are, as a core business, a, a B2B service provider, although we do have operating licenses. We're also focused on the Italian regulated market. Uh, we offer a, a turnkey service uh, to online, uh, licensed online operators as well as licensed betting shop operators. So multi-channel is a significant part of our business. Um, as I said, we offer either turnkey services or single verticals, and Casino is our number one vertical. Uh, and within that, about 60% of our business is actually outsourcing the casino delivery to our customers. And the rest of that, about 40%, is what I would call a value-added aggregator. So we, we provide the games, but also we, we provide services and, and promotional tools. Um, so because we, we also fully outsource the casino management for our customers, we have kind of two hats on, and we look at the business both as a supplier as an, and as an operator. Um, we don't produce our own games. We made the strategic decision that, that was somebody else's business, and there are plenty of people who know how to do that well. All our effort is focused on uh, helping our, our customers craft player experiences. So it's about our, you know, having proprietary tools and know-how based on the broadest portable, possible portfolio of games available in the market. Um, we have we have a you know what would look like a narrow portfolio compared to somebody like Hero Gaming, but you have to remember that in in a ring fence regulated market like Italy, you have very very high barriers to entry. So there's a lower number of suppliers actually certified, and it's actually kind of expensive to have broad portfolio because games have to be recertified. But we have about 1,200 games on a regular basis, and I'll talk a bit more about how we manage those later on. Obviously, we have a dedicated internal team that does that working together with our customers' teams. And I'll end it there. Thanks, Marco. Uh, and last but not least, Daniel, please. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, can you hear me OK? Is the mic OK this time? All good, thank you. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, so I'm Daniel Mitten. I'm a head of casino across Dunder and Kasumo, part of Kasumo Group. I've been in the industry coming on seven years now, uh, previously working at Mr. Green and William Hill International before moving across to uh, the Kasumo brands. I would say Dunder is classified as more of a, a carefree, fun casino. I've been in the industry since 2016. Uh, we operate in a myriad of different MGA markets along with the UK GC, and we're unfortunately currently going through a closure of the Swedish market at this time. Um, however, please do stay tuned uh, as there will definitely be some exciting things ramping up going into uh, 2021 for the Dunder brand. So, yeah, keep an eye on that. In terms of product, uh, we offer 2,500 plus games across RNG Casino and Live Casino. Unfortunately, no sports book just yet on the brand. Uh, for Kasum Casino, uh, this is our brand new uh, pay and play model casino, which only launched last Tuesday. So definitely check that out. It definitely has that sort of boom appeal to it. Um, it's a new age uh, for the consumer brands themselves, launching its first pay and play round across the group. Uh, we certainly have some grand designs for this next phase of launch going into 2021. So it's uh, definitely it's definitely exciting times ahead for the brands and the consumer brands as a whole. I would classify Kasum Brands as a exciting and daring casino, offering 2,000 plus games towards our customers across casino and live casino. Now, the important question I would say is how do you get your slot offering on our casinos? Uh, first and foremost, we're on the gig platform. So we work hand in hand with the platform and the games teams to feed into our own roadmaps uh, across integrated providers, which they have a, a very large selection of. The games would need to be of a certain product quality or specific design uh, for a localized market to be added to our release roadmap. And we do have a, a dedicated team that does the screening across the product to make sure it does have the best possible product quality uh, for our customers. In regards to new game builds, obviously uh, in my position, it's one of those things where you really have a passion towards if you're into your slots. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been blessed to be able to work with any game builds just yet on uh, Dunder and Kazoom. 
However, on my previous companies, we've worked on several builds and reskins. Uh, and for me, it's one of the most exciting parts of the jobs, getting those sort of creative juices flowing and building some fresh and exciting uh, product uh, for the industry. Thank you very much, Steve. Thanks, Daniel. That's, uh, that's great. Thanks, guys, for a great introduction. So let's uh, let's get into this. So what's the, uh, the first question I'd like to ask is, what's the most important thing for you guys in terms of makeup of a slot product? So that I mean that could be BAM, that could be mass, positivity, uh, RTP, performance elsewhere. And then how do you apply those characteristics? And obviously, there's no real one size fits all. You're in different markets, et cetera. So how do you apply that to the different markets that you're in? Uh, should we start with Stefania? Sure. Uh, so basically, for uh, for us, for casino room and uh, for high roller, we rely a lot on localization, and we try to offer different uh, different content to our players. And I think the most important part here is actually knowing your audience and knowing how receptive they are and knowing their preferences. Uh, and we did build different profiles for our players based on their uh, their value uh, segment and also based on their. Um, uh, uh, location. So then we noticed that uh, there are regions, for example, like Northern Europe, that are uh, and higher value players are less receptive to to newer, flashier content. And then we're very careful and we try to to provide them with a more uh, classic, land based uh, feel. Uh, so I think uh, just to, to briefly answer your question, I think the most important part is knowing your audience and knowing which product you would like to to offer without forcing it upon them. So you say it's a combination of uh, all of those things with regard to each of the markets? Yes, yeah, so obviously. it's uh, Different markets would obviously have different preferences when it comes to uh, volatility or when it comes to, to the math of the game per se. Uh, but I think you also have to consider your uh, particular audience for that casino, because for all the casinos I worked before, I was surprised to see certain games performing uh, somewhere and on the same market uh, not being as, uh, as performant. For different brands, so I think it's a, it's a sum of game mechanics as well as brand characteristics. Okay, so tying tie the casino with the brand, that, Daniel. What what, what uh, how does how does how does that draw? What did you look for in a in a slot? Okay, so in my opinion, uh, I, I tend to classify the players when we're looking at slots into kind of two different brackets and and kind of simplifies the the sort of you know, viewpoint on, on the different scope of the different products. So I would say you have mainly two types of players in the industry, if I had to sympathize it. Um, you have a, you know, a classic casual game player who comes in for the experience, the fun of the casino and the products, loves a cheeky little free spin campaign. And these are the type of players you need to target with sort of a medium volatile feature rich game uh, with the RTP kind of pushed into uh, small, medium, constant wins. So that's what I would kind of look out for if I'm, you know, looking for those sort of casual game players uh, when I'm looking at provider roadmaps. Um, and then you have the the high roller, typical high roller player who's coming in for the thrill of the big wins. Um, they look more towards a darker theme, I would say, in general in their games. And you know, I'd say they're looking to you know, more of a volatile feel, um, only seeking those big wins, and, and sometimes they even look past. Uh, the aesthetics of the games just focus on the math and mechanics of the games. So you've got to kind of cater your thought patterns to scope all these play different player types. And I, I would say um, these are the sort of target market you're looking for with like your high rollers, your VIPs, and they're, they're simple but effective games, which basically push a lot of the RTP straight into one feature and make it simple but effective. And then you have the also the other side of things, which is looking more towards localized markets and localized content where, you know, for example, Germany, you're looking at high volatile Egyptian slots, Norway, you're looking at classic Joker slots, Netherlands, you're looking at localized Dutch slots and free reelers that really hit the mark in those markets. And UK even, they have UK classic, UK branded and uh, fruity slots, which really hit the mark. So it, it kind of cases down into, for me, going back to basics is two different player types and then looking into localized selections on top of that when I'm looking at the portfolios. Great insight, thanks. Uh, Marco, how about Italy? I mean, I know there's some very specific brands that work in Italy uh, and, and, and some that are quite surprising. Yeah, so in, in, so in terms of um, choice of uh, choice of games, um, um, as I said, we wear two hats and, and with, our, with our B2B hat, I think the, the, the fundamental objective is to give the customer what they ask for. So it's aiming to get a complete portfolio. So, so the, the, the first objective is to have in our portfolio 
all of the major um, established uh, slot, uh, slot providers in the, who are already in the Italian market, as well as, uh, as, well as the new things that are coming. Um, so there's a very strong Me Too effect in the market. So as soon as an operator sees that somebody has a slot from a producer he doesn't know, they, they're, they're immediately curious and they want to they have the same thing. So I, I don't think it's something that is necessarily uh, adds a lot of value to the business, but it is a, it is a part of the market dynamic we have to, we have to reflect. Uh, so very, no, very complete market. portfolio. Sorry? So a me, too, a me Too market. Yeah, yeah, it's a Me Too market. Now, now with the operator hat on, of course, then we, we really are trying to look for games that contribute to the kind of experiences we want to create. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all it's all very much about having a, a complete uh, set of different clusters of types of games in terms of volatility and maths and themes, but also looking for games that are positioned to fit certain player segments. So, for example, a couple of segments that are of particular interest in Italy are, of course, the younger demographic. And, and as, you know, there are a lot of studios that are coming up with games that have, for example, skill components. To appeal to those younger demographics, so clearly we're very interested in introducing them and, and seeing what kind of uptake they get. And the other very important aspect in the Italian market where multi-channel is very, very important, and, and most of our customers actually have a strong multi-channel component to their strategy, for example, sourcing online players in retail. So what we call bar slots, you know, uh, games that cross, cross over from AWP or VLT titles. Um, are, are very important and very important part of the mix because there are a significant segment of players in the Italian market who look for those um, and thinking about how to cross over that experience from the from the machine to you know physical machine to a, you know to a mobile or, or a computer is clearly a very important part of the of the picture. Okay, great. Thanks, Sam. You got anything to, to add to that? Yeah, I mean, not to not to repeat. I mean, we have, of course, the same challenges that the, the rest of the guys have described there. When we when we're choosing a new game, I think all the elements the guys have mentioned are, are there. Um, but there's also certain sort of uh, themes and threads that we look for. So, you know, there was a period where um, you know the Nick's kind of. Um, the megaways was a was was all the trend and and everybody wanted megaways games and then there was all of a sudden so many of them that players kind of got bored of them and now we're seeing you know um a lot of players enjoying feature buying um and these sort of uh you know skipping straight into the action straight into the bonus round i think you know the the reality of, of modern gaming is that the vast majority of players these days don't really have the patience to even bother getting into the the bonus round. They'd much rather buy their way in there, or um, uh, you know, have some some uh, some shortcut to to kind of experience the most they can in the shortest period of time. So we look at those types of trends, and and obviously, if we find a game, a new game that where and a mechanic that really works we sort of would go through our back catalog and see if we can find similar types of games to pair up with them um and so i said there, there are these sort of almost sort of fashionable or trendy themes that run through the games from time to time that's probably one one addition um and then i think you know when it comes to uh our sort of targeting our games uh, and when we're choosing slots i mean our approach is when we receive a new slot game we run it through um a sort of feature catalog because we're very transparent about our games uh, towards our players so we would uh you know kind of make a note of all of the key features the payouts the volatility rating rtp uh, base game rtp base game hit rates um, we map all of that information out and then we use that against the existing catalog of games when we're targeting it. So I agree there is to some extent, you know, the sort of mainstream and the high roller and there is uh, some regional differences. But I also think that uh, the features and the, the mathematics of the game can be effectively sold regardless of those factors by uh, being smart about how you manage the, the features in, and uh, uh, various game uh, statistics. And then finally, for us, we're a lot more of the, and I think we'll talk about this a bit later, but a lot more of the suppliers now are offering um, 
quite rich uh, feature um, features and, and API offerings. We're quite at the forefront of that. We developed something uh, last year called Blitz, where you can play 100 slot rounds um, in approximately you know 20 seconds. Um, very, very fast gameplay um, on some of our games. And then this year, we became, I think, probably the certainly the first in Europe to uh, essentially use the API features to to allow players to buy into bonus features and bonus rounds on games that didn't a- actually allow that through the game themselves. So, for example, Jam and Jar is a very popular title. You can come on our site and, and buy your way straight into that bonus round. Again, going back to um, the type of sort of player habits and, and things that we're seeing and trying to use those tools effectively um, on the existing games and new games to to uh, develop the experience for the players. Okay, great, thanks. I guess that leads me on to my next question, really, which is if you've got 2,500 to 3,000 3, slot games, um, how is the – and most of, I know that most, um, most operators now have their own algorithms that will personalise the offering for the player. So I was going to ask about how – that works in terms of automation and how what you're looking for in terms of that player experience and how does that wider technology offer that for the benefit of the player so um daniel can you can you talk about that yes of course um yeah so looking into algorithms and driven by you know personal data and how we actually you know pump those games into our you know players offering in my opinion there is actually you know, a very fine line when managing your offering to our customers uh, uh, in between, you know, product quality and sourcing the best possible product. And then the elephant in the room is kind of like the cost of sales background and monitoring your, your baseline margins on the casinos. Um, so it's it's trying to, you know, optimize the best possible route forward, you know, keeping in mind both, you know, the product you want to push towards, you know, you want the best possible product towards your customer, and but then at the same time, you've got to think about your business and your baseline KPIs. So it's a very fine margin. So you're always looking to optimize uh, and automate anything going forward. Um, for any key casino, this is the main thing. Um, however, as you said previously, you know, we need to have this right balance and we need to have an algorithm in place, in place to actually push the best possible product for our customers and for your casino. So technology can definitely help in this regard. You can use, you know, personalized player data on a, on a, on a player level to offer kind of like a personalized experience, which we did something similar at Mr. Green with our one-to-one lobby, um, giving you a sort of like Netflix type feel with, uh, you know, different suggestions and swim lanes and this sort of uh, eclectic uh, personalized touch and feel on a separate vertical for those customers utilizing the technology from the algorithm. But also in the back, you have to think about your baseline cost of sales. So it's a fine line. Okay, great. So 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 matching the, the kind of RTP with a the kind of margin uh, with a, with the, the theme and the offering and where it fits. Uh, Stefano, yeah, do you have? Any- no, exactly. So it's always keeping an eye on your commercials from a business point of view, but then always pushing the best possible product as you can, looking at localized markets, uh, you know, the type of game that they're playing, what type of volatility is, what type of themes, and creating algorithms and using technology to actually suggest the best possible product, but always keeping an eye on your commercial baseline. Okay, great, thanks. Marco, how, how does that work work for you? Okay, so we, as I said, our portfolio counts 100, 1,200 games, although, you know, 30 to 40% of that is renewed every year. but. Uh, you know, from a player perspective, that's too many in in our view. Uh, so we we've been working for many years uh, to figure out how to guide the player's choice in a way that will benefit his experience and also, you know, to some extent, optimize margins for the operator. So we built in uh, algorithm-driven positioning onto our platform in 2013. So we've been doing this for many years. Uh, we went for a Netflix model before Netflix even existed in Italy. Um, and our, our, the, the way we manage our showcase is a combination of manual and algorithmic. So, for example, the content of the landing tabs is controlled manually because it's based on decisions linked to specific commercial strategies, promotions, new introductions, and so on. But there is automation that kicks in at specific moments of the player's journey. 
And the two key moments are during the sessions and in terms of the composition of the preferred tab, which for us is really a suggestions tab. The preferred tab for us is dynamic. And both the outcome of the sessions and the composition of the preferred tab is tailored to the player in the sense that the algorithm uh, provides suggestions in real time that are based on that player's activity. Um, and we found this technique, even though it's, I mean, it's, it's relatively rudimentary, although it is automated in real time, uh, but it was quite effective because by, by focusing on these two uh, sort of touch points for the player, we intercepted 65 to 70% of the decision moments. Uh, we track the players, you know, moving through the websites uh, and, and see what he decides. And ultimately, our algorithm is there for 65 to 70% of the decisions the player makes. Um, now, that's, you know, the algorithm is always driven by manual decisions anyway. So, for example, the whole, the whole system is based on how we cluster games. Um, we, and, you know, we, we've developed proprietary know-how on how to do that, and it's evolving uh, all the time. And probably the next stage is to try to build in machine learning component into that, although I'm a little bit skeptical of, of, of doing that. One last thing I'd like to say about the, the, the algorithm is what I found very interesting is how the algorithm helps you manage the long tail. Because we look at our portfolio, you know, we, we look. I look at the last six months, and our top five games did 22% of the total GGR. And to make 40% of GGR, it was only 23 games out of the 1,200. So there's a huge long tail. But we we try to use our algorithm to use that tail to generate variety for the player. And we found there's a strong correlation between the player lifetime value and the number of trials. The number of games the player tries is strongly correlated with uh, frequency of login and uh, duration of sessions. Uh, and so a lot of our thinking is about how can, how can we use all of these random, these hundreds of slots that, you know, on aggregate do a very small percentage. How can we use them in specific slices of time to generate interesting experiences for the player? Um, so I, I think it's a fundamental part of the um, casino strategies having this kind of tool. Definitely, thanks. Uh, Sam, briefly, if you will, uh, we're, we're kind of conscious of time here. Um, anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, the, so we, when we talk about sort of player algorithms, I think we, we sort of start with a player-facing algorithm. Of course, when a, when a customer comes in, you don't know anything about that customer or that customer's play, but from their registration details, uh, you will know that uh, a 90 year old uh, lady from Poland is probably going to have a different risk or game profile to an 18 year old guy from Sweden. So you can, of course, what you're first looking to do is for that initial conversion point. And so the, there's, there's an early algorithm which kind of looks for which game is best going to convert this person, which best is going to get this person flowing and starting. And also, you know, one of the things you have to be conscious there on is um, the sort of entertainment value to loss ratio. So if you start people off with your most spiky games and you, you, there's a high chance that you'll burn those early customers out quickly. So there's also a level of experience of understanding that, you know, there are starter games, there are lower volatility games. This is why Starburst was always such a fantastic uh, starter game because you just had such high hit rate and, and and a sort of this sort of nice volatility mechanic that uh, that kept people interested and then ultimately once a player chooses a game the most obvious way to customize their experience after that is game recommendation so people who played this game also probably likely to play this game and again there's many many different ways in which you can approach that model from uh, highly complicated multivariate regression uh, models um, or there's just using some basic uh, a basic understanding of the games team uh, the games team understanding of the game and the, the features of the game and a little bit of kind of regionalization and gut feel and and uh, to be honest I've seen both executed uh, we go for the sort of simpler one and I would say uh, it's just as effective as the big, large, multivariate machine learning algorithmic approach from, from my personal experience. Nice. A, a bit Not of gut feel goes a long way. Uh, great. Stefania, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I'll try to be really fast in this one because, uh, <laughs> well, most of the have been said. 
Uh, so uh, the only thing I, I wanted to add is that, yes, of course, we believe in algorithms and we are all big fans of Netflix. Unfortunately, we are no Netflix in terms of the te technology we own at the moment, so we can't go as uh, personalized in the user experience. So then I do believe in algorithms, uh, and there's also the manual factor, uh, because uh, even for, for AI, it's been proven that Okay, so customers do like this sort of game that take grid slots and they will be playing mostly grid slots, but there's always going to be that one differentiating factor because let's be honest, we don't wake up in the same mood every day. So one day you would like to try something different. And I think that's when the, the real kind of cross sell happens in between products. Great point, thank you. So yeah, guys, I'm gonna ask you uh, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you two questions in one here. So um I just wondered about the platform features because there's a lot of platform features now coming to the market and each platform provider seems to be focused on coupling these features with um, with the, the actual content. And so um, uh, I'm just wondering how, um, how, that, how that matters for the best performing games and how, how broad that is now in terms of, the, of how deep that goes and, and how much you rely on that with uh, differentiating the offering because these, these, these uh, feature sets seem to be expanding. And then while I'm talking about that, I mean, there's a literal mass of games, but we've got, you know, we've got the US regulating, they're saying there's 20 million players coming on within the next three to 10 years in that market. There's various other markets regulating, et cetera. So I wonder how you see that affecting the digital offerings in the next, uh, in, the, in the future and what you see the future of, uh, of, of slots in the, in, the, in, 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 that, in, in, the, in the short period to come or even in the longer term. So um, why don't we start with Marco on that, please? Sure, there's a mindful of time. There's two questions. I'm going to focus on the first one and leave the future to uh, to my distinguished colleagues here. Um, so I'd say I'd say in terms of um, uh, I'd say the platform here really is the key and not not the games. I mean, if we consider that game portfolios ultimately look very similar, if not identical, from operator to operator, and obviously everybody, it's an obvious point now that the, the player experience is the key to differentiating and competitive success. Uh, and the platform is the way to differentiate the experience, ultimately not the games, if everybody ultimately have the same games. In terms of platform, I think there are two aspects that stand out for me. And the first is the tools have to be game and studio agnostic. So we, you were, we were talking about how um, game providers are building in uh, all sorts of new uh, tools to their, uh, you know, um, to their games, so gamification tools or other things, and ultimately for the operator, I think this is this is a limitation because uh, uh, ultimately you're not going to be differentiated from your competitor who has the same uh, slots with the same tools. And also, this is the most important point: you're not really going to be able to generate a differentiated player experiences unless you have these tools that work across your whole portfolio. So, what we've all, we've invested in our platform to have sort of a single back office from which you deploy all the tools, including promotions, including bonus across all of the different portfolio. That's fundamental because you don't really have control of your strategy unless you do that. And the second aspect, I'll close on this, is, is, is the make or buy dilemma. So to generate a platform that does that, you cobble it together from existing modules or you build your own. And ultimately, you know, the, the, the operators will be really competitive are the ones who do the latter because um, tight integration between the different modules, whether it's bonus management, whether it's gamification features, whether it's the CRM, you know, the, the database of your, that, that drives your whole strategy, tight integration is fundamental to, to having smooth workflows with which you can deploy, uh, you know, tailored, uh, tailored promotions or tailor a website to a player. So ultimately, putting things together from, from commercial modules is, is going to be very different. And, and just closing on an example, we worked with an industry-leading CRM module until two years ago. We had to ditch it and build our own because we found there were so many things we couldn't do, uh, including you know, not having specific tools like context-sensitive data, which would allow us to really generate the multi, you know, control the multi-channel experience. So it has to be game agnostic, and you know the, the features have to be on the operator's platform, not on the slot provider's platform. And the ultimate platforms are the ones that are made in-house. Um, ultimately, that's kind of my provocation. Okay, thank you, May. Nathania, what's uh, your what's your view on this? Uh, so, yeah, I definitely agree with Marco that we all have more or less the same product, and then there's there's the question of 
what makes you special as a casino? What are you giving back or how is your experience any better than your competitors? Um, so yeah, I think that the main challenge that I've encountered is when, when you have a very established casino, like Casino Room that's been around for 15 years, and you have all the integrations from the top and previous, uh, previous uh, platforms that are well known and established, bringing that novelty and bringing that innovation is kind of, uh, it's kind of a tricky part. But I do agree that, uh, that we need more tools and better tools to actually give more exposure to the, to the games. Yeah, thanks. And the future? For the future, oh, that's a very good one. If only we would knew. Um, so for the future, I think it's a mix of, as you said, the US market is uh, is very strongly regulated. And they're also a lot going towards that. They're also very, very good regulation in Europe at the moment, getting uh, more day by day. I think the progress will be into a time of new rules and they will be I think we're getting some, some crossover there, but um, I, I think we had some of that. So thank you. Uh, Sam? Thank you. Yeah, well, let's focus on the future then and uh, all of these US guys coming online. And, uh, perhaps something controversial for me, but one thing that would concern me is that the current consumption um, of games in the US is very old fashioned. Um, the types of content and games that, they're, that they are consuming en masse are, are very old maths, very old titles, very old models. So, my concern is if you know if suppliers want to uh, want a piece of that action, um, are they going to spend considerable amounts of their time uh, re-engineering older uh, and and sort of less European focused games? So, for the likes of us who are who are operating outside of the US um, due to the the punchy regulations and 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 cost of and barriers of entry, are we going to suffer? Um, with the supply that we get in Europe because they focus their energy on a whole new wave of people playing really old fashioned non-European mechanics. Interesting point. Yeah, that no, could certainly go that way. Daniel, do you have uh, a view on that and uh, where it's going to go? Yes, yeah, so I think that's already been spoken by Marco and, uh, you know, Sam and, and Stefania there, but uh, just in regards, just a little bit on, on topic of promo tools. Uh, yeah, I think it, the new promo tools and new promo tools that are actually coming out definitely add another layer to our product offering, especially with those with uh, full automation and new innovative mechanics to the market. So it kind of gives uh, the customer a new gaze on, on how you can you know market your products differently with these new promo tools coming from the provider back offices and uh, helps elongate the churn of uh, those customers back to you casinos for, for longer periods, we found. Um, but however, I, I think the art is in simplicity these days. I mean, there's uh, a lot of different multi multifaceted different pro materials coming out that are innovative that, that don't always work. Um, you don't always have to have this uh, and overcomplicate the tool. I would stick to the basics and lock down a solid CRM plan, looking at more of a, a global and a localized level. Um, for your customers and just making sure that they are familiar with these mechanics so they know exactly what they're getting when they come to your casino. Um, then later on, I suppose you could branch out and experiment with these new tools and, and try and run some KPI analysis behind it to see if they have actually had some sort of uplift on your casino and see if this mechanic has actually worked. Um, then touching on the points, yeah, your next point, uh, Steve. Yeah, uh, in reference to the US markets, I can very much see providers in the future going towards uh, product in innovation aiming at sportsbook cross-sell, I would say, in the USA, maybe looking at another avenue of uh, virtual sports or slots specifically designed to, to yield results from uh, cross-sell campaigns, uh, given the fact that uh, a lot of the, the mass majority of the revenue coming from the, the US um, markets is yielded from the sportsbook sector. So I can see them probably focusing on that given towards the next three to 10 years, looking for innovation on the sports cross sell and, and improving those virtual sports or even designing the sort towards uh, those campaigns. Then obviously with uh, the gambling industry um, constantly, the landscape constantly changing uh, with the new regulated markets, Germany just around the corner on the horizon and tighter regulations from uh, larger markets such as Sweden and UK, 
the providers themselves are limited in regards uh, to looking at innovation on new products and features inside the games and new mechanics. Um, I'd say that they're, they're mostly held up on actually catering towards those uh, regulation stipu stipulations uh, and making sure the products are compliant for those markets over the coming years. So I wouldn't expect too much innovation coming out of those providers with um, you know, the strict regulations coming into force over the next couple of years. Okay, fascinating. Yeah, okay. To be seen, I guess. Hey, guys, we, we're out of time and I don't have any time for questions, so uh, apologies for that. But um, thanks a lot for your insight and, and all of your great your great input in, in, in answering all these questions. So I really appreciate your, your time today and we um, uh, look forward to catching up with you guys soon. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Dave.